This is an interview with Albert DeFazio as part of the Italian American World War II Veterans Oral History Project sponsored by the National Italian American Foundation and the Historical Society of Western Pennsylvania. It is November 8th, 2004, and we are in lovely, beautiful Penn Hills, Pennsylvania. Will you please tell me your full name and date of birth for the record? Uh, my name is Albert DeFazio Sr. I was born uh, January the 14th, 1925. 1925. Got a birthday coming up. Yeah, January. Tell me a little bit about, about your family background. Who was the first immigrant? Your, you, your parents came over from Italy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, my dad came over. He was single at the time. And uh, after that, uh, uh, my mother came from the same town as they did, and she was living with her brother down there in down at the uh, Hill District, the lower part of the Hill District. And oh, really? With her brother. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they knew each other from the town in Italy. Well, what town was that? What was that name? was a town that was on top of the mountain outside of Naples. It was called... Uh, uh, Artevillipine, it's uh, Abruinja de Avellino, that's the Providence of Avellino. Avellino. was a town up in the mountains. Mm -hmm. Well, then anyhow, my dad had migrated, he went to New York mm -hmm. first, and then New York, he spent a little time in Boston, and then he migrated back here to uh, Verona. Oh, really? He went to Verona? Yes. And what year, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then, like, sure, then he had a, a brother he called for. Mm -hmm. Uh, he came over and uh, he stayed on East Road Avenue too, in a house that my dad owned. And uh, he died as a young man. Then he met my mother, and then they they got married. And uh, on East Road Avenue in Verona there. And uh, raised five children, four boys and one girl. The four mm -hmm. boys are still here, and I have a sister that's in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course we. We were brought up during the Depression, hard times. Yeah. And uh, what did your father do? To, what did he do for a living? Well, you know, during the Depression, there wasn't any jobs. Yeah. When he come over first, he worked on a, the buildings up in New York, and uh, he had uh, a beam had fallen on his foot, and he was got crippled because he didn't know how to speak American, and uh, he had weights on his leg. The nurses didn't know, you know, they didn't speak Italian, and. Uh, he ended up a cripple. Then when he come down to Verona, he got a, a job at the Union Steel down in Lawrenceville. But that was only a few days a week. And when the Depression hit in yeah. 29, you know, and uh, everybody was out of work. Nobody was working. People were on relief, you know, getting whatever they could. Food gets so much. We got seven of us in the family. We got $7 a week. I mean, you said relief. Who gave that to you? That was money, you said seven dollars a week? That welfare. Welfare would be the government. The government. The federal U.S. government. Yes, that's when uh, Roosevelt got in and he brought in uh, Social Security and mm -hmm. he brought in uh, the 3CC camps okay. and uh, WPA, you know. Mm -hmm. At least people worked for it. Yeah. But then uh, we had two houses in Verona and um, my mother said when we all started to work, she told him to call them up and ask him how much we owe them. So we sold one house, the house I was born in, told my brother, he said, I think, forget what it was, a couple grand or something, mm -hmm. sold the house and sent the check in and paid them off for what we got for relief. Oh, really? Yeah. My you mother, had to pay him back? We didn't have to. Uh-huh. We didn't have to, because at that time, you was in, it was in the house, they had a lien against the house if you ever sold it. Mm. But it was in the family until not too long ago, but then... My mother said, well, well, we'll sell it, and I had my oldest brother call down and ask him, and I think it was around two grand or something, and sold the house and sent it in. But we didn't have to. We could have hold on to the house and, and wouldn't have to pay nothing. But she wanted to pay them. Hmm. She appreciated, the, you know, that we got something to live on. Yeah. So she didn't... Seven dollars a week, a dollar per, per person. I guess her mentality was, you can't get... Nothing's free in this world, I guess, and her mentality, she wanted to she wanted, do it right. She wanted to pay it off, and we did. It's on mm -hmm. record. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you grow up speaking Italian? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I spoke, uh, well, the whole five of us spoke Italian before we even learned to speak American. Mm -hmm. 
because even when they went to school, my my oldest brother, when he went, he, they didn't understand him. Asked him what his name was. He says, my name is Pellegrino. That's Italian, you know. And his name is William. Yeah. yeah. So we learned to speak Italian because all around us was Italian people. Yeah, tell me about the, the, the Italian community in Verona. Oh, did you know the Logies? No. Well, they lived next door to us. Procopios lived there. There, back of the Procopio's houses would be Caddy Corner, the where your homestead was in. Is that Recuperos or Recuperos down there too? Jimmy oh, Recupero. Oh, oh, okay, there. Yeah, oh, that's what Jimmy Recupero. Okay. Then it was the Myolas was there, and then mm -hmm. a De Libertas, and uh, we was all uh, mostly all Italians there. It was about eight or nine families hmm. on that one block, plus what was across the railroad tracks. Right. So uh, there was uh, mostly a uh, Italian community. It was, it was, all the people were good, even the uh, non-Italians were nice people. We all got along fine. Yeah. Yeah. So, it uh, was, everybody knew everybody, everybody you know. Mm -hmm. If you needed help, somebody was there. Right. But uh, well, we all got along, which was good. Yeah. Did, um, what did your, um, your family life, did your father... Well, any clubs in Verona, Italian clubs, or did he make wine, pebocci? So yeah, that well, stands out in your mind. My dad made wine as far back as I can remember, mm. always. Mm. So he only drank a glass of water just for the fun of it. You know, we'd taste him really? about it. Oh, yeah, he'd make five, six barrels of wine. They were 50, 60 gallon barrels, too. And uh, he, we drank wine, and on, on Sundays, all the. Um, Italians or most Paisans would come to our house mm -hmm. and they would play cards. Briscola, Trace Set, the boss and under boss and the, whoever who, whoever won, they got to drink the wine and who wanted to give it to this guy, this guy, this guy. And every Sunday. They had a good they had a good time. They all come away every Sunday come to the house and uh, they drink wine and or if my mother had some stuff uh, salami or supersad or whatever, you know, she would put it out and we were kids running around. But everybody had, nobody had anything, but we had a wonderful time. Hmm. We really did. Can't, I can't, uh, my, my, of course, at that time, who's your dad going to take you out to play baseball or football? So, no way. We had a big garden that uh, up on top of the hill there, up in uh, uh, South Verona Hill. Okay. Man, when we came from school, we all went to that garden and we worked, we had a big garden. And that's where we lived. My mother canned a lot of stuff. So that was your dad's garden? That, that, oh, yes. That was his own... Uh... The, well, we had the garden, but not the ground. Ah, okay, not the ground. It was big. Everybody had... Uh, all the Italians from down there had a piece of ground up there. Big, big piece of ground. And that's how most of it went in jars. My mother canned a lot of it. And, uh, of course, she baked bread all the time. And uh, I never ate store-bought bread until I left home. Get out. Yeah, she always baked bread, made handmade macaronis, her own sauce, everything. Then, of course, we used to go out, we used to pick this stuff. We were kids, we'd haul it from from uh, South Verona Hill, down past across the boulevard and at home, and, and we'd sell it. Hmm. Sell corn, 15 cents a dozen, tomatoes, peppers. You know, what, kind of, what kind of vegetable, what kind of... Items did you have in that garden? You said corn and tomatoes? Everything. everything we had uh, tomatoes, uh, like, uh, corn, we had greens, we had uh, peppers, uh, any kind of vegetables you want to want to think of. We've had. So this pretty, this, especially during the Depression, this helps sustain your diet. You couldn't go to the supermarket and have the money to buy this stuff. My God, no. And we used to uh, haul them down on our shoulders. We were, I'm talking, we're kids, uh, 10, 11 years old, half bushels on our shoulder, go down, like I said. Mm -hmm. Go down past where the De Libertas lived on the hill, and then we crossed the, the the highway, Allegheny River Boulevard, and uh, go home. And uh, like I said, we'd sell whatever we could. We had left my mother put it all in a can, hmm. jarred everything, hundreds of jars. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the way we we sustained life. Cause who had money to go out and buy this? Of course, everything was cheap too, you know. But uh, yeah. it was a hard life, but it didn't hurt any of us. Yeah, you know, didn't hurt none of us. We did. We did pretty good. I can't. I can't. Never say that I went to bed hungry. I can never remember that because always something in the house. Not the money, but 
always had a piece of bread, or we had some salami, or olives, or whatever. Like you said, you you were you were happy, and you had fun too. Oh God, yes, we used to play so, out. Yeah. We used to play out in the middle of the out in the street there against the telephone pole there, where the railroad tracks passed there. You know. So you didn't have no TV. No, no, no radio. Games, no computer. No radio. We didn't have but radio. You had fun. Oh yeah. We enjoyed it. No telephone. No nothing. But we made our own fun. We almost we practically lived down in the river. You know, the river wasn't too far from us. Yeah. We go swimming every day. And You're really in the river. Oh yeah. People say, "Oh, that's dangerous. That's dirty." No, you just go swimming. Yes, <laughs> huh? swimming. Yes, of course. We never went alone. We always went in a group in case anything happens. Then we used to go over what we would call the ball diamond. That's where the, um, you know, where the. Uh, uh, Pipe company was over there now uh, across the railroad tracks. Is that where that uh, Demore Tires is? Yes, the Children's Center. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now we used to go over there. There was yeah. nothing there but uh, shacks that the old railroaders used to stay in occasionally. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and we played uh, rocks and stones, but we played. We had a good time. We played softball. Yeah. Well, baseball wasn't big at that time. It was. It was all softball, mush ball. Yeah. And we had mush after ball. that. Yeah. This now, is mush ball. Mush mush ball was a bigger ball than a than a softball, and it was mushier. Oh yeah, that's what they called mush ball, and then uh, just played out and a hard ball. But then after that, we go down into the river, which was right to go swimming. Go swimming. Had a good time, and then go home. Where did you go to school? St. Joe's, Verona. Oh, the Verona. Public yeah, public I school. went to St. Joe's a few years. Okay, that's when they had the um, the nuns, and that's when they had uh, we had to go in the morning and fire up the stoves for the heat. They were all wooden buildings, and that. the outhouses was outside. Yeah, I oh, heard that. Yeah. Then I then I went to transfer. They were they were tough, but man, man they could uh, they could teach you. Oh yeah. Yeah, because it was only seventh grade and eighth grade. You went to the public school then. We knew everything already. I thought we were a year ahead because of the discipline of them, the nuns, boy. You had yeah. to they smack your hands with them rules, man. They didn't care, man. They were tough, but they it, like I say, it didn't hurt anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious to know. Um, you know, both your parents were from Italy. Maybe they, were, they weren't around that time when Mussolini came to power. But did your father or mother ever talk about Italy when you were growing up and what was going on over there? Did they know what was, what was occurring? Well, my uh, I asked my dad one time. I said, Pop, I don't know, I was maybe 12, 13 years old. Mm -hmm. I said, uh, would you like to go back to Italy, you know, and uh, visit? And the funniest thing is, my dad says, no. He says, there's nothing over there for me. And his mother was still living over there. Wow. He had such a hard time over there as a child. You know, when you went to work over there, you went to work, you was seven, eight, nine years old. If they paid you pennies a day, my mother the same way. My mother had, uh, I think she had two or three years of school. My dad had one. Hmm. Now, for my dad to say, no, there's nothing over there for me, he loved this country, even though he come up during a depression, because they worked hard over there. He used to tell me, go out and, and pick the olives and the figs and the hoe the gardens, you know, for the for the landowners, you know, hmm. and they had it tough. So I, he, I can understand now why he said he didn't want to go, hmm. because of his, and his mother was there yet, you know. Yeah. But they used to write all the time, and he would do what he could, send a buck or two, you know, whatever he could. But we didn't have it ourselves over here. Mm -hmm. And then he never went back? No, he never went back. No. Um, but he had brothers over there. Yeah. That would be a later Did he become an American citizen? Oh, yeah. Did he? Him and my mother, yeah. yeah. Wow. Do you, you know when? I have no idea when. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But then you had to learn. You had to learn how to speak it a little bit and learn to read and write your name or whatever mm -hmm. before you became a citizen. See, they had to go downtown to the courthouse. Mm -hmm. okay. And they had to learn a little bit about everything before you got your papers. And they both did. I mean, my mother and dad both spoke uh, uh, English. I mean, they killed it, but you could understand what they were saying, you know. Yeah. But at least they learned, you know. Yep. Tell me about... Um as a young man, what did you think was, what did you know that what was going on in, in uh, Europe and uh, over in Japan, the Pacific? What did, uh, I guess by that time in 
late thirties, early forties, before well, before the war. You were in high school at that time, right? Yeah. What, 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 what did you know was going on? What were you? What was your thoughts about it? Well, I really didn't have no thoughts, and uh, of course, I never graduated high school. Mm -hmm. I quit high school when I was sixteen years of age. Mm -hmm. I went to work right away, you know. And where was that? Well, I, I carried a little bit of hard for, for a plaster man. And then I went to work. I went to work for the uh, water company. This was back in 1940. Mm -hmm. uh, for 35 cents an hour, I was a flagman. And then uh, when the job was done there, I went to work at the uh, where the Giant Eagle is now, the American Steel Foundries. Oh, okay. Went to work in a steel mill. And then from there, of course, I I, I carried every day too. When you got 12. You, Twelve years as old, you got your working papers from the school, yeah. and me and all my other three brothers, we went caddying at Longview Country Club. Okay, you know, to to make a few extra bucks. That was a hike. For hike, we, we used to uh, hitchhike, How but you had that? to wait about an hour for a car to come by. Because nobody had the cars back then. Yeah. Oh man, we used to hitchhike right there at the uh, beginning where the old police station was. You know. We used to hitchhike, but you had to wait for for a car to go by because no red cars in them days. Really? Yeah. Even that, was, what, that was that was nineteen thirty nine. Nobody had cars. Well, they had cars. I'm yeah, talking. Wasn't that many? Wasn't that? There many? wasn't that many cars. You had to wait for a car to come by to hitch a ride. Yeah. I can't imagine uh, Allegheny River Boulevard having no cars. Um, yeah, I remember so when packed. they put that in too. We used to hitchhike from there down to you know where Nady Pump Station is. Yeah. Or down to there, and then walk either walk up or one of the members. Going up to the Longview Country Club would pick us up, yeah. and then come back. We do the same thing. Well, tell me about. It. I'm sure um, working at the Country Club. Um, of course, you were a caddy. There, not, there wasn't very many Italians at that time. <laughs> Members. Oh no, not. I can't remember one. Right. I can't remember one Italian member. One. Not one. Well, not one. No. We're. Um, how was it working for, for working at the the club? Caddy, it wasn't bad. You get you get yeah. some some members were very nice, even though they had money. You know, some of them were were pretty good. Uh, and you get you, know, you get good and bad in everybody. You know. Yeah. And uh, you have to take it. What are you going to do? You, you know, you're a caddy in there, and you want that dollar and a quarter, and uh, you did what you were told. And, yeah. And that's it. But they weren't bad. They weren't bad people to work for. Them was really nice people. Dollar and a quarter. That's it. A dollar and a quarter for eighteen holes. Yeah. That's that's the standard rate, or is that? That's the rate that were for eighteen holes. Then you get a, a, a tip with that too. If they give you a tip, some yeah. of them did, some of them didn't. It all depends. But, um, that that's, I didn't get out every day though. Yeah. Uh, I was se I went seven days a week. To, all of us went seven days a week. To caddy. To caddy. Doing a I only got out Saturday and Sunday, Monday till Friday. Forget it. But I went, in case there was a tournament. If it was a tournament, then there were a lot of people. Oh, well, Monday through Friday, you went up there anyways, and sometimes you didn't get out. Right. Shoot. Went seven days a week, and maybe maybe got out Saturday and Sunday because that's when everybody come out to play. And that's during the that's that's course during the summertime. All day through the summer, yeah. 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 You, work, you work seven days a week as a seven-year-old. As, 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 no, 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 as a 12-year-old, seven days a week. Oh, yeah, Excuse seven me. days a week. My mother used to pack our lunch, peppers and eggs. Peppers and eggs. Oh, yeah, and the guys wanted to buy them off of us, too. <laughs> we say peppers and eggs on a sandwich or just... Fried. My mother used to fry the peppers uh -huh. with the eggs in there and put the sandwich in homemade bread. She'd pack our lunches and we'd go there seven days a week. <laughs> Probably charge three dollars for that. Oh man! <laughs> yeah. Well, they'd steal them off of you too. You know, that, that was good eating then. Yeah, I can't. It's, it's hard to imagine. You you went to work seven days a week. Yeah. As a young twelve year old, not yeah. even a teenager, to make money. Yes. Uh, then that's not counting working up in the garden too. You know, all all summer too. And we had a little garden behind the house on mm. East Road Avenue. Wow. Twelve years a day. Twelve year old kids today have it lucky. Oh, are you kidding? They don't know how good they got it. I guess so. You didn't. I guess by forty forty one when the the Japanese attacked and nineteen hundred nineteen forty one. Yeah. Where did you December think that day? Did you know where that was? You were like, what the, What's going on? Where's that? Well, well, like I say, I was about uh, just. 
just turned 18, I guess, you know. You know, at that age, you know, what do you think, you know? What can you think? You don't know until you get into it. Yeah. So I never really uh, give it much thought, really. But uh, then it wasn't too long, you know, then I was drafted at 18. <clears throat> Into that was 1943. You were 18. Yeah, 1943. Mm-hmm. Did you see many, uh, many of the uh, your the guys you knew, maybe your friends at uh, in Verona that were being drafted before you in 42? I guess. Did you, did you see them go? And no, no, because they were a year or two younger than me. They went after I did. Because we all loosed together, oh, okay. we were, all, like, group. Okay. We were all Italians, and you know, yeah, um, there was a, the Boscos, Libertos, and uh, we all loosed together there. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were a year or two younger than me, so they mm -hmm. went in after I did. Okay. So when you got your draft, your draft notice, at the, you were to port. You had to go downtown, huh? Oh yeah. Well, when I got my draft notice, uh, they told you that you had to go downtown. You Get your physical. I gave you a physical. And then uh, he got, went home. I forget for how long. So, then they <clears throat> they sent me to uh, uh, training grounds at Aberdeen, Maryland. Okay, is that Fort Meade? Fort Meade, okay. yes. And um, they interviewed me there. That's where they interviewed everybody went there. Oh, okay. Of course, we took off from the Wilkinsburg Station to uh, Aberdeen, Maryland, and they <clears throat> had a big room, rec room. Mm -hmm. They would set you down and interview you, you know, they ask you all kinds of questions. Cool. So he's asking me, you know, about you graduate. I said, no, I quit school at 16, and about your mother and your father and stuff like that, you know. And he says to me, uh, what branch of the service do you want to go? I said, well, I'd like to try the Marines. And he says, uh, he said, pick another branch. I said, okay, I'll go into the Navy. He said, well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in the Army. I said, well, why did you ask me what branch of the service I wanted to go if you knew all the while you're going to put me in the Army, which I didn't care. Yeah. And he sort of smiled. And he said, well, you're in the Army. No, he said, I got to, I said, I'll tell you the truth. He said, it's because you don't have a high school education. Yeah. Huh. He said, that's why. Or else you would have been whatever branch you wanted to. I said, okay, I didn't care. Uh -huh. I didn't much care. So then, uh, okay, put me in the Army, and he uh, sent us over to the um, quartermasters. Uh, they give us our uniforms. Shoes. They just take a look at you and they throw this on there and give you this. They give you shoes about that big. And um, I said, "Hey, these are kind of big." He said, "Well, exchange them wherever you go, you know, because you got hundreds and thousands of guys coming through there, you know. Yeah. They didn't have. They can't take no time to measure your feet. Well, anyhow, from there they shipped us uh, down to um, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. That's Camp mm -hmm. Shelby." Big army camp down there, okay. and they put me in the uh, 69th division. 69th division. That was a uh, 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 one of the known uh, divisions in World War One. Mm -hmm. Was fighting 69. Well, anyhow, they shipped us there, and uh, they wanted to. Um, of course, we went on our 25-mile hiking trips, and we went through basic training, which was which was tough, man. You you ached your muscles, but they didn't care, man. Every day you went through that, man. I mean, but it was good. I mean, uh, you ached and everything, but it was fine. So then, finally, they uh, give us a couple of weeks to go home. Mm -hmm. So I went off, got home on furlough. There was nobody around the town. They were all gone then. Some had gone to the service or whatever. Then there was nobody around. As a matter of fact, it was boring to be at home in Verona. Mm. I couldn't wait to get back. So anyhow, when we got back um, to camp, they said, well, we're going to sh get shipped overseas. I said, okay. So they got the, the lieutenant comes out there, and he had a, had the sheet, and he's going to read all the names off. Alphabetical order, you know. The guy's just going to ship out. 
he's reading the names, he gets down to the D's, and he gets past the D's, and I, well, my name wasn't on there. And uh, when it was when it was all over, he said, uh, "Okay," he says, "We got another list here that's supernumerary." I don't know whether you know what that means. No. Supernumerary means if nobody can go, then they'll pick somebody from this group. But I was in that group not to go. Oh, well, my, well, my name wasn't called. I went up to the lieutenant and said, hey, you passed me up. I got my name. And he says, oh, you're on the second list. I said, what are you talking about on the second list? You mean I'm not going? He says, no. I'm, I'm not I said, oh, no, 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 no. I says, I'm going. I want to go. I says, I'm, I don't want to go with my friends. I don't want he said, listen, there's nothing I can do about it. I said, man, I was really down and out. I said, well, I'm not going to let it go. So I went to the headquarters, and I ex asked to speak to the captain in charge there. So I goes in, and so what can I do for you? So I said, well, listen, my outfit's shipping overseas. I'm not on that list. I want, well, how come I'm not on that list? I want to go. And he says, uh, well, I'm sorry. He says, I had nothing to do. This comes from headquarters. You know, well, why? Why me? I mean, uh, he says, well, I can't taste. I can't help you. I'm sorry. I said, well, I want to go. I don't want to stay here. So then uh, he said, I'm sorry. Because so I left and I, I felt bad. But then the, the next day, the, the lieutenant comes up to me and says, hey, I don't know what you did. He said, but you're going. You're on the list. I said, oh, good. I was happy to go. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, we got together and they shipped us to Newport News, Virginia. That's where we were shipping out from there. Okay. So, so they say we're going to be in a convoy of about 500 ships going. We didn't know where we were going. Mm -hmm. Could you they, hold that thought real quick about Newport News? I just, I'm just, I like to know you wanted to go so bad, and that was to be with your friends, or you just urgency to you wanted to, to get this. To get to get out of the states, to get into the war theater. To, well, I felt what, I felt that that I, didn't, I felt that if I didn't go, I would it would I would be like a slacker or something. I want, didn't know what yeah. it was all about. I wanted to go because I was with my friends, and I didn't want a, anybody to say that hey, I wasn't picked to go overseas because there was a war on. Those was the two main things. That's okay. why I wanted to go. Okay, thank you. So you were in Newport News in this convoy, huh? Well, they told ships. us there's a, a convoy of 500 ships because they had some um, uh, submarine destroyers there to mm -hmm. protect us, going with us. And uh, anyhow, they loaded us 500 guys to a ship. They were a Liberty ship commanded by the Merchant Marines. Okay. It was nose to nose in the bunk. Anyhow, we boards them and. We go out, to, go out to sea, and they anchored out there waiting for the convoy, for everybody to come in there. We still don't know. We asked where you go. We don't know where we're going. Okay. So, so we're out to finally, the next morning, everything, the convoy's ready. We take off. But we're zigzagging to avoid the submarines. And uh, they said, called for chow time. So we get in line to eat. They give us a cup of whatever, I don't know what kind of juices or whatever, and a cracker about eight inches round. Dry the sweat. Okay. We go down the line and say, well, where's the rest of it? He said, well, that's it. I said, what are we talking about? That's it. We're going to starve here. That's it. That one cracker a day was something to drink all day. Man, the guys were starving. We, we, we could survive on that. So somebody broke into the hole of the ship. And down under there, they found uh, crates and crates of C rations, K rations. That's what they issued you. Man, them yeah. things was coming out of there until they fishing them out to everybody. When they found out, man, they went down there. Man, they welded them hatches shut because that was stuff was supposed to go for overseas. But we were starving. Really? Yeah. And uh, as we were going, man, we hit we hit one heck of a storm. Hmm. That. Bulb, ship, or boat, whatever they want to call it, man, that thing, you'd see it a wave, it'd go up. And then Sunny would come down, dome, you'd see nothing but water. And here, I was almost washed overboard. I should have been inside here. Good thing I grabbed onto a rope, or rest I'd have still been swimming, because that ocean's big. Okay, we're 
good. Okay. Anyhow, I'd hear a shrill whistle, and somebody would come out over the phone or microphone and say, the smoking lamp is out. The smoking lamp is out. I said, well, what is this, the smoking lamp's out? Yeah. I said, if the lamp's out, light it. Here they tell us after what it is, no smoking. At night, I smoke anyhow. No smoking, because if this uh, submarine's out there seen a flicker of light or something, and they say there's something not there. And they, uh, okay, so they told me that's what it means, no smoking. And then they talk uh, starboard side, port side, the front of the ship, back, uh, this or that. I said, what are they talking about? I didn't know that the language, you know. And he said, well, the port side is the right side of the ship, but uh, this is the left side, aft is the back. I said, well, don't they call it like it is then? You know, I said, well, anyhow, it took us 30 days at sea, 30 days to the day. 30 days. Finally, we spotted land. When did you leave? Oh, I don't remember the day. Was it 43 or 44? Oh, yeah, 43. Okay. Yeah, well, because I, well, I was drafted in yeah. 43, and I 12, 13 weeks of basic training, you know. Yeah. Then right after that, it wasn't too long, three or four months, and then we're gone. Anyhow, here we landed at um, Casablanca, Africa. So we was there at uh, camp, at tent 16 to a big tent. And they told us, uh, listen, when, when you go to bed, you sleep with your rifle next to you because them Arabs in, in uh, Casablanca there, we, in Oran, it was Oran, Casablanca, they'll break into the camp, man, and they steal whatever you got, maybe even cut your throat, you know. In no case, every once in a while you hear machine gun fire, you know, they, they, someone try to get in and they shoot them. Well, anyhow, we got uh, leave to go into Oran. A lot of French over there, too, you know, in Oran and in Algiers and that. So then we, they said, well, now, when you go into town, don't venture out alone. Or always be in a group, four or five. So you don't know what's going to happen. And make sure the, the truck is going to come back. Make sure you're there to pick you up because we're not running a taxi service here. Right. If you don't catch it, you miss it. You know, you miss the truck back to camp. So we made damn sure. But anyhow... We was there for maybe about a week or two, so they shipped us to the train station, mm -hmm. and uh, they loaded us on uh, what they, well, there was uh, really cattle cars, that's what they were. They used to haul cattle in them on the railroad. They put 80 of us to each car. You couldn't lay down to sleep. Mm. You had to sit down with your knees up, you know, and uh, occasionally they would stop. You'd get off and eat something and uh, stretch your legs, get back on again. It took us three days to get from Oran to Algiers. I went to Algiers. And man, we'd go through the, they had tunnels and we'd go through the tunnels. Now these had, these areas were steam engines that burned coal. And when we went through the tunnels, all that smoke, where was it gonna go? Everybody was coughing and hacking, all that black soot and smoke coming into there. Man, we couldn't wait to get the heck out of there. We went through three tunnels and was almost choked to death every time. Wow. <laughs> from the smoke, from the coal, wow. it's it uh, yeah. poisonous. Well, anyhow, finally we got to Algiers. Took us to camp. And uh, in the camp, they were starving us there too. We were getting one meal a day and everybody got dysentery. Now, what's that? What's that? Diarrhea. Diarrhea. And uh, man, you'd see guys running, getting up and running for the latrine. Running. And when they stopped, goodbye. That means they let everything go. They couldn't make it. But there was one place there, the Arabs, they were selling some beautiful oranges, man. They were like that. Mm -hmm. Thick skinned, nice. But to get any of those, you had to be there in the morning, early in the morning, waiting for them to open up. And they would always sell up because you're talking thousands of soldiers there. You know, if you were lucky enough, then you got some, you at least you ate some oranges or something. Well, anyhow, then uh, we got orders. We're going to ship out again. So they take us to the seashore, and there was a, an English transport ship there. I mean, it was a, I thought it was the Merrimack from the Civil War. That's a hold it wasn't, cranky. You know? <laughs> it was a troop ship. It belonged to the wow. English. Anyhow, we boarded that at night. So we takes off. We go through the Straits of 
uh, Sicily and uh, the mainland was to the right. And so we got to a, a spotted land, you know, I was, at, I was at the front of the ship. And, you know, uh, a funny feeling come over to me because I said, that's where my mother and father were born. They probably took off from the port of Naples to come to America. And it's left me with a funny feeling, you know. Wow. So then when we uh, got off of the boat, they took us to the uh, what's called Mussolini's Roy Racetrack. That's where he had big tents there. We camped there. And um, this one time, they called us for chow. We went to chow. They had some meat. And meat, it sort of had a sweet taste, and it was stringy and real red. And I said, well, what kind of meat is this? And one guy says, he said, that's horse meat. I said, what are you talking about? They won't feed us no horse meat. He said, this is a racetrack, isn't it? I said, yeah, what's that got to do with it? He said, I tell you, it's horse meat. I, I didn't believe him. Anyhow, just for a joke, anyhow, I took off to go back to get, I went, I was going at a pretty good trot there, you know, but I don't, to this day, it could have been horse meat, I don't know, because it was yeah. different. Yeah. Well, like beef, you know, it was, it was different. Yeah. Well, anyhow, they, yep, I made a joke, on. maybe it was or maybe it wasn't. Was it good? Well, it wasn't, well, hey, when you're hungry, man, you uh, eat anything. Yeah. 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 Well, anyhow, they come back, come around then. And they give us uh, patches. They had put me in the 36th Infantry Division out of Texas. Uh -huh. And uh, they gave us the patches, and uh, we had to sew them on our jackets. You had to sew them on yourself. Huh? You had to sew them on yourself. You sew them on yourself because you had a little sewing Or there was somebody around camp, make a few bucks, he would sew them on for you. You know, mm -hmm. put them on your sleeve. Okay. On, on your shirts, on your sleeve, and whatever. Okay. Anyhow... Come the time to ship out, and uh, they loaded us on the trucks. It was at night because we're headed towards the front lines now. So when we get to the bottom of the mountain, you could hear some shooting going on, you know, big stuff, not small stuff. So we stayed there overnight. It was cold. This was in January. The next morning, we, we dug our foxhole, laid in there, slept at night if you could sleep. Next morning we all we all line up, just waiting. So then, three of us started to climb this mountain that was near me and two other guys. So finally they blew the whistle to come on back down, get together, we're ready. So we comes down, and this one lieutenant, he wasn't from our outfit. I don't know who the heck he was, and he said uh, the three guys that climbed up in that mountain there, part way. Who are you? You know, raise your hands. And I'm saying to myself, I said, what's he want to know why I climbed, we climbed the mountain? Two of the guys raised their hands, you know. And me from, from boot camp, a guy told me, an old sergeant, he said, never volunteer for anything unless you know what it is. So that thought came to me. I said, I ain't, ain't going to put my hand up. So I didn't. I just put laid down, put my head down. He said, who was this? One more guy, one more guy. I said nothing. So anyhow, I told them two guys, come with me. He went, as they went with me. So I'm asking around, and I said, well, why, why did he know, why did he take the two guys there? He says, well, they want to make uh, mule skinners out of them. I said, what are you talking about? Are you going to skin some mules and eat them or what? He says, no. Now, to go up, there's a lot of mountains over there. Now, to go up to the front lines and that, they used mules. And they need, needed the good soldiers to guide them up with ammunition, food, and that. And that's what they wanted them for. Well, I wasn't going to be no mule skinner. That was, so I got out of that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't volunteer. I said, no. I said, I ain't going to put my hand up. Not me. I don't want to be no mule skinner. Well, anyhow, so then we starts up to the top of the mountain. I forget the name of it. And this is in now near Naples. Yeah, well, it was, was right. outside of Naples, yeah. And uh, we get on top, and uh, we start to pitch our tent. We had pup tents, two to a tent. Well, we put two of them together so we four can sleep. More body heat. Well, anyhow, the mailman comes around. He hollers mail call. You know, he always try to get the mail to you as often as they could, once, twice a day, or well, at least every day. 
so we all gathered around, and he called the names out, and he'd give you your mail, you know. So the one lieutenant, he, he told the mailman, he said, you going back down to camp? Bottom of the, he says, yeah, I want you to tell the cook to bring some, uh, f make some fresh donuts and bring some hot coffee up here for these men, because it's cold. He says, okay. So the next morning, he comes back up to the mailman. He said, well, did you tell the cookie, you know, to bring it? He said, yeah, I told him. He said, but he said, it's, it's too dangerous to come up there. So the lieutenant tells him, he said, you going back down? He says, yeah. When you go down, you tell the cook, either coffee and donuts or him. And he went, and he went down. It wasn't too much longer. Here comes him, mules with coffee and donuts. Right. Said, oh, yeah, yeah. And brought him up and give it to the guy. Well, anyhow, nighttime. We went to bed to sleep. Next morning, I got up, got out. There must have been about four inches of snow on the ground. In know, Naples? Outside of Naples. So this, this was in January. In the mountains. And up in the mountains. Now, you were up in the mountains. Four inches of snow on the ground. Now, that day was January the 14th. Your birthday. And the reason I remembered that, because that was my, I just turned 19 years of age. Just turn wow. I, I didn't even I didn't even tell the guys I was with there that I never said a word to nobody. I was afraid, well maybe they're gonna say, Hey, come on, let's go. I'll take you into town. He said, We'll have some dinner and, and get a few drinks, come back. I'm well, well, just joking now. But no, but I never said a word to nobody. But anyhow, you know, we go on watch, it's four on, four hours on, four hours off. So many guys. So we was in a wooded area. And off to the right of us was a, like a plateau, had big rocks. And as you're looking out over, you're looking out over uh, the river, the Rapido River, over on the Monte Cassino. Okay. That's the abbey, That's where the monks were. Mm -hmm. Well, anyhow, I, me and two other guys was there, plus our captain of the company was there. Mm -hmm. So the, the captain looks down at me, he says, hey, soldier, he says, uh, well, first of all, they said, when you on watch there, he said, don't move around too much, because if you moved around, they seen you moving, the Germans, they'd lob a few shells in there, you know. He says, we don't, we don't want that, just, just lay low, occasionally, just make sure nobody's coming. So the captain tells me, say, so he says, uh, how about going down there, he says, and get the heater. There was a little heaters that we had, he said, then we'll have some hot chocolate. Cause we used to get candy bars in there. You'd melt them for hot chocolate. And he said, hey, soldier, go down and get the stove and bring it up. I said, if you want to go down, get it yourself. I told the captain. Then he'd hit me. I said, oh, my God. I said, he's going to court-martial me and sh put me against the wall and shoot me down like a dog because I disobeyed an order. Oh, it was on my mind. So finally our, sh our shift was over. And I'm going back to the camp. And I'm talking to some of the sergeants and that, and I said, they're going to court-martial me. And the sergeant says, no, nothing's going to happen to you. I said, what are you talking about? I disobeyed the captain. Yeah. I'm going to tell you something. He said, read your book. No officer or non-commissioned officer, that's a sergeant, corporal, or whatever, is to tell you what to do if they wouldn't do it themselves. He said, he didn't go down and get the stuff, did he? He said, no, he told me. He said, then he was wrong. Nothing will happen to you. And he was right. They, sh they don't tell us any soldier to do anything that they wouldn't do themselves. He wouldn't do it. So nothing ever happened. And it's in the code book. He, he told me. Well, anyhow, we're getting ready. He's the, uh, he came around and said, well, we're going to put an attack on. We've got to cross the Rapido River and put an attack on Monte Cassino. Okay. Oh, the body on its... So we all, we all get together, and he says, now they're going to put the smoke pots out, you know, so they all smoke. And when, when we're headed down, I want you to every, hold the back, backpack of the guy in front of you, because you can't see nothing. Yeah. And the guy on the side of you, we were, we were really piled in there, so we started down the mountain, run into the smoke. We grabbed the, uh, the guy in front of me and on the side. Going down, all of a sudden, oh, all hell broke loose. There was artillery shell coming in there. It, it blew the smoke away, lit up the sky. Oh my God! In heaven, I was seen 
bodies ripped apart, three or four piled on top of each other. I couldn't believe my eyes. This part all shot off. And I just couldn't believe it. And then within seconds, another one hit. Same thing, another pile of mangled bodies. Oh, my God, I said. So I just, I just was in the side of the bank, and I just hit the ground. I, I didn't want to see any more. Nobody, you couldn't see nothing. Nobody was giving commands. So I said, well, i got to do something. So I got up and I headed forward to get away from it. I come to the, to the river. And I'm looking down the river. They had pontoon uh, bridges stretched from one side. Because it wasn't a wide river. But it was swift and it was high because of all the snow we had. And the mountains was melting. And it went and curtained like hell. And I look downstream, and there's there's soldiers down there crossing the, the bridge, breaking loose. They're falling into the water with all their gear on them. They're drowning, and and uh, I've seen one or two of them break loose. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I look upstream, and the bridge was there. I says, "Well, I got to get across here. That's what we're supposed to do. I got to get across this bridge." I said, "I wonder if I can make it." So I got up, was by myself. I headed across, and I hit the other side of the bank of the river bank and I didn't want to put my head up because there's a lot of small arms I was supposed to get to shoot my head off here but I had to look because I was looking maybe if they would sometimes they would counterattack. right and if they did I didn't want to be caught with my head down and I was there all by myself the rest of them were still back there charred up so then finally I heard something an order come by it says, fall back to the positions. I saw, I looked back, the bridge was still there. I said, I got to get back there again. But I hit that bridge, man. I saw muddy steps. I got on the other side and headed back up towards the mountain, threw the smoke back up. And when I got up on top, man, I was cold. I was wet. I was tired. I, I just put my head between my legs and I, I just couldn't believe what I saw. I couldn't get it out of my mind. And when I got home, I got nightmares. I was afraid to go to sleep. I'd stay up out as long as I could, and I'd stay up, but it didn't work. It's still nightmares all night. It took a good while. Finally, it went away, and thank God I could at least sleep again. Well, anyhow, I'm, I'm sitting there. Here, The lieutenant comes by, and he says, uh, <clears throat> Put some dry socks on. He said, we're going back again tonight. I said, oh, my God. I says, I, I'm not, I won't make it. I won't be back. I can't be that lucky with what went on. I couldn't rest. I didn't even eat. I didn't put no dry clothes on. I just sat there all, all day. <laughs> Finally, night time, time comes, and they assembled us all together. And uh, they said, well, this time we're not going to have the smoke pots out. I says, thank God. I said, whoever the idiot was that ordered them should be shot. We lost a lot of men. Because they hit us right in the middle. We were like packed in like sardines. They knew where we were, and we knew where they were. Shouldn't have had them smoke pots. But anyhow, he said, they're not going to have them. I said, okay. We starts back down the mountain. We're getting close to the place where all hell broke out. And uh, I says, I'm trying to brace myself for what's coming. How do you do that? How do you brace yourself for something like that? Anyhow, we got down, nothing, quiet. We got down to the river. This time, instead of footbridges, they had rubber pontoon boats. You know, anchored on both sides. I says, thank God. I said, I wonder who the guy thought of this now, too. Get away with the bridges. Because get in the boat. If the boat's loose, you floated downstream. Yeah. You know, anyhow, me and, well, before that, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Uh, they relieved my captain, the one that I told him to uh, go get the stove yourself. I don't know why. They brought another guy, and he was a redhead. His name was Lieutenant Spike. Nice fellow. He was a, a, a first lieutenant, not a second. Well, anyhow, he got us together and told us, well, I'm your new commander here. He says, but I'm going to tell you something. He says, uh, most of you guys will be killed before I even know your name. Oh, I, said to myself, I said, that's a nice thing to say. You know? yeah. But he, he was right. Anyhow, when he'd come around, try to 
you know, to get acquainted with everybody. It was me and my buddy that it, that I took training with in camp. He says, you know, you two guys, you look so much alike, he told me. I can't tell you two apart, which is which. Well, well I know, you know. It's, it's, he said, you look so much alike, like twins. Well, which we weren't. Well, anyhow, getting back, then we got to the river. Me and my look-alike. And the second... His, what huh? was his name? I don't remember his name. And I went through everything. I don't know why. I don't remember his name. I, well, was he Italian, too? No. Yeah. No. Anyhow, me, him, and the lieutenant gets in the, the rubber rack. We shimmy across. I'm on the bank. We're the first ones across. So the lieutenant looks down at me and he said, let's go. I said, okay, let's go. I got up and we and there was there was a field there. Beyond the field was Monte Casino on the mount there, the monks there. And this field, there uh, was no trees. It uh, was a, looked like it was cultivated for something. And I, I don't know, maybe they growed wheat on it. for the, when, the, when the monks grinded for flyers, maybe they made the, the secret recipe for the bread. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, it was it might have been some kind of a field. Anyhow, I got up. We started across. My buddy was to my left behind me. The lieutenant was on the side of him. And we're going towards Monte Casino. So I looked to the left, and there was my buddy. To the left of him was a lieutenant, and on the other side of the lieutenant was a big gap before the other company. Well, I don't know how it was big. I don't know how far away they were. I looks behind me, nobody there. No soldiers, nobody there. They were back at the river, or still trying to cross. And I'm out there 50, 60 feet by myself, never missed a step. I turned around, and I kept going towards Monte Casino. Nothing. Everything was quiet. I says, good. I said, they must have left Monte Casino, you know. No sooner than I said that, boom. Oh, my God, a shell come and hit behind me. It blew me two or three feet ahead into a drainage ditch where it had water, half full of water. And I was stunned by the, the shock. I didn't know where I was. Finally, I, I come to, and, and, and I felt the pain behind me. I put my hand back in my pants, neck in there, and my pants were ripped. Stuck my hand back, and my finger went inside a hole. I'm in blood, I knew it was it. Took that out, and I had another sting in my back. I put my hand back, the same thing, my backpack was ripped in my shirt. Put my hand back, and same thing, my finger went in a hole. Oh. So then I looks over to my buddy to my left. Oh my, my look like, oh my God, he, his back was shattered. He probably took the blunt of it. He was gone. I, I don't know how you know, I know he was gone. He was dead. He didn't move, he didn't yell, he didn't say nothing. Finally, I heard the lieutenant holler up. He said, you guys all right? I said, Lieutenant, I know. I said, I'm hitting two places. I said, I think my buddy's gone. He says, well, get back to the river, get some help. I said, yeah. I said, how am I going to get back there? I'm, I'm here hitting two places. There's nobody around to get help. They're all back at the river. So I said, well, I have three choices to make. I could either get up and try to get back stay there, freeze and bleed to death, or stay there till they capture me. I said, well, I'm, I don't want any of the two, two or three. I said, I better take a chance. So I got up. I could. I was fine, you know. I was hurting. I was hurting. And I started back. I had to go 50, 60 yards back to the river to get any help at all. So as I'm going back to the river and then to the left, not, well, there was, as I'm going back, there was a small arms fire, machine gun, small arms fire going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could just feel the bullets going past my legs. How I never got hit again, I'll never know. I could hear them whizzing across me. I must have been lucky again. Anyhow, on the way back, this one shell hits, and I see this one soldier bounce about, oh, maybe six, seven inches off of the ground. So instead of me going back to the river where the boat is, I cut to my left towards him because he was hit. I went over there and sure enough, who in the hell was it? 
It was this Lieutenant Spike, the one that said, most of you will be killed before I even know your name. And he was shot up bad. He must have got it directly with a board. But he was alive yet. He was just moaning. And, and uh, I said, we got to get him out here. He's going to die here because by this time, the rest of the guys are going back across the river. There's nobody there. I finally hollered at one guy, one soldier. I said, hey. I said, this is Lieutenant Spike here. He's hit bad. I said, we got to get him out of here across the river. He's going to die. And he said, okay. So we, we got him. We drug him down to the mm -hmm. riverbank, put him in the, in the rubber raft, shimmied across. I said, we didn't know where the first aid station was, the hospital. Mm -hmm. So what we did, I cut this, this look across the river, make sure there was nobody there, make sure they were all back across again. Mm -hmm. I cut the ropes, put him in that boat, and me on one side, the other guy on the other, I didn't even know who he was. So we started to carry him along the riverbank. And I was hurting, and I was bleeding. Finally, we run into some, some of the soldiers there, and we told him, do you know where the field hospital is? He says, yeah. As you go down here, bear to your left. You can't miss it. You'll run into it. So we did. I don't know how long we walked, how far. So we got to the field hospital, and uh, I told the guy there, I mean, there were bodies all over the place there, because we got hit bad there. Oh, we got hit bad. Um, a lot of guys, were only eight of us come out of my platoon. And anyhow, I said, the lieutenant here is hit bad. He said, okay, we'll take him right. How about you? I, well, I'm hitting two places, but will you be all right for a little while? I said, yeah, I'll be all right. Sit here. I'll, don't move. So he took the lieutenant in. It wasn't too long they come back after me. They brought me in there. Took the shrapnel out. And next thing I know, I was in the hospital in Naples. So... Then they, they, they come around, of course, they give you this out the Purple Heart, and then years later they, they sent me the uh, Bronze Star. Give me that. I got a Bronze Thank Star for it. Now, <clears throat> the guy that was killed, my buddy, went through camp. I don't remember his name, no matter how hard I try, I can't remember his name. I don't know why. We went through camp, and I don't know. I don't remember his name. Even the lieutenant, lieutenant Spy, I don't even know what his. I don't even know whether he survived or not. I don't know whether he made it. But anyhow, from the hospital, they shipped me back to my um, platoon, mm -hmm. my division. Well, anyhow, well, that was a rest area. They uh, said, "Well, get ready. We're going on a hike." Yeah, I said, what the hell? We're supposed to be back here resting. Yeah, we're going on a hike. On a hike. Yeah. Jeez. So it's a full pack. I was about 80 pounds here when he carried everything on your back. We started out at night, and when we started out, it started to rain. Not hard, but it started to rain. This was still winter, right? Oh, uh, yeah. This was in January. In January still. Yeah, this was January. Uh, of course, when we crossed the river, it was on the 22nd of January. Well, anyhow, we got to this mountain. And he said, well, we're going on top of the mountain there. We're going to camp up there till morning. So it's raining. So we starts up this mountain. And uh, they give you a rest every 15, 20, whatever it was. We sat down, still drizzling. And I happened to look behind me. And I seen a light. I said to the guys, the two or three buddies, I said, there's a light farmhouse over there. He said, yeah, so what? I said, I'm going over and see about it, see what's going on, what it is. What yeah. are you talking about? We're going to be, we're going to be pulling out pretty soon. I don't care. You want to come with me? Fine. I went. Two other guys was with me. It was farmhouse. Knocks on the door. I started talking Italian to the guy. I told him, you know, who what we were, this and that. And I says, uh, uh, listen, I says, uh, when I started talking Italian and everything, you know, then he was at ease a little bit. He's Italian, you know. Said, yeah, yeah. Was, you know. So I said, do you have anything to eat in here? And he says, well, the only thing I have is, is I have some bread and I have some chestnuts and wine. Good enough. So he invited, we went in there and all sat down there at the table. He brings a big bottle of wine like that, a big bowl of chestnuts and Italian bread. You know? yeah. Man, we drank. I'm not a big drinker. Yeah. I drank some wine. We ate chestnuts and ate the bread. Stanya. And I told him, I said, listen. 
Okay, so you were going to so, stay overnight with the so, eat some castagna. So anyhow, that mother guy said, hey, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, we got to be on top of that mother guy. I said, I don't care. Well, anyhow, in the morning, we heard trucks down below. And we see, we looked down, and there's some trucks coming back. I guess it was going to pick us up, or we was going to be a ride. And uh, so the guys were saying, so what are we going to do now? What are we going to tell them? I said, I don't know. Where do we get down? So we started down at the bottom of the mountain. The trucks are all lined up waiting. The sergeant comes over, over, and he says to me, he said, where were you guys? I said, where were we? I said, on top of that mountain, cold and wet, and, and, and uh, that's where we were with you. He said, oh, okay. He said, get in the truck. We're going back. And when we got in the truck, we started to laugh. The whole three of us. The rest of the guys in the truck thought we was crazy, you yeah. know. But it was so funny, you know. And uh, we laughed all the way back to camp. And weeks after, we'd think about it, and we just must have laughed, you know. Because <laughs> so, they thought we go. Because if they didn't know that we was in that out sleeping and everybody was on top of that mountain, I don't know what would have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyhow, we got back to camp, and we we got to get a leave to go this um, to Avellino. It was a canteen, you know. It had no beer in it. You could have, it had anisette or they had cognac uh, or wine, you know, and I wasn't a drinker. So we get in there, and uh, this soldier comes around and he says, Hey, is there anybody here from around Pittsburgh? This American soldier. I says, Yeah, I said, I'm, I'm, from, I'm from the outskirts. And this Pittsburgh. was in Avellino, this Avellino. little, little yeah. town. Yes. Mm hmm. And, uh, I says, uh, why? Who wants to know? He says, there's a little Italian guy over here that's been asking everybody if there's anybody here from Pittsburgh. So I goes over and I starts talking to him. In Italian. In Italian. He's like, oh. It was my mother's first cousin. Wow. As true as God made green apples. He said, oh my God. He said, you have to come to my house. What I'm going to call. Huh? What was his name? I don't remember his name. You know, but, yeah. It was. I know it was my mother's first cousin. He said, "You got to come to the house. I'm going to call the town, Doctor Villapine, and tell them you're here because I have uncles there. My dad's brother and sister was there, and uh, my mother's sisters were at the, the town." I said, "Well, I got to be." Oh no, we can. So there was no transportation. So he hiked down a horse and wagon. I used that as a taxi, and we went to his house. From there, he gets on the phone, and it was hard making connection. He called the town where my mother and dad was born, told them that I was here. He said, oh, he said, they want to see you. I said, yeah, I'm going to leave right now. I'm going to go to see them, you know. Well, anyhow, I said, i got to get back. So I went back to camp, and then we went to camp another place, and this one uh, lieutenant that was there, because occasionally I would smoke a cigar, a marshmallow cigar. And I had written home, and my mother, and they sent me a box of marshmallow cigars. It was a long cigar. I, like, I just spent every now just a puff on And this uh, lieutenant or captain, I forget what he was, uh, he liked to smoke a cigar. And he'd always come down and bump a cigar off me. I say, I give him one, I give him two, you know. So I say, well, now it's my turn for a favor. So I went to him and I said, listen, I got relatives not too far from here. In fact, I got uncles, aunts, cousins. I said, I would like to get a pass to go. He said, well, I'll tell you what. He says, I can, I don't know, we're, we've got orders to ship out, but I'll give you a pass for two days. That's good enough. So, I, the trains are running then. They have beautiful trains over there. Did they? Oh, them, them, they have big picture windows. They were all electric, too. There were no steam engines. And uh, they had green velvet seats. They were beautiful, I'm telling you. You could hardly hear that train pulling on. Anyhow, I got off the train, and I went as far as uh, Foggia. And I remember that Foggia is where my dad said when he was a kid, he used to take the mule and go to that town and sell figs in that town. So when I got to Foggia, I said, told him, I says, I like to go to the town, out to Villapin, you know. And I, he said, well, it's a distance from here on the mountain over there. I mm -hmm. said, well, can I get a bus? He said, bus? You want to get there? He said, you got to walk, because all the bridges was out. No transportation. I said, well, I'm here now. So I started to walk. He told me to take this road. Started to walk. 
And I happened to run into the Italian father, and I started to talk to him. At least I said, you're wearing your uniform at this time. Oh, yeah. Right? Helmet and oh, gun. yeah, I have everything. Not the gun. Yeah, the gun. Just the uniform. And I run into this Italian fellow on the road. And I said, do you know where the town of Artevilla is? And he said, well, fuck, fuck. He says, yeah, it sits on that mountain up there. I talked the mountain. I said, okay, do you know certain names? He said, well, I, I don't know people yeah. from up there. He said, but do you see that little farmhouse down there? I said, yeah. He said, why don't you go down and ask him? You know, he probably knows. So I went over there and uh, knocks on the door. So a little short time fellow comes out there. It was my mother's brother. My mother's brother, so help me God. Oh, man, he grabbed me. He come in. He said, you got it. I said, I want to go into town. Up he said, we've got to get something to eat here How'd first. You, when you find out he was your mom, was, he was your uncle. That was how, my uncle, yeah. How did that come about? You saying, oh, this is my name? And yes. I knocked on the door, and I told him uh, I got relatives up there. I told him my name is Albert uh, DeFazio. De oh, I said, my mother was just a pina galassa. Well, he's a galassa. Oh my God! He said, "You're my 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 you're my uh, my sister's son." I said, yeah. Oh my God! He grabbed me, brought me in there. You got to get something to eat first before well, I'll take you up and and meet everybody up there. Okay. That's so then we ate something and uh, he took me up there. I met his sister, which is my mother's sister. Then I went over and, and met my father's brother. I stayed with him overnight. Then I went and met my father's sister was over there and oh I had to come she was a nice beautiful woman you have to come over here to eat she made homemade fusils you know macaronis and I had to go over to her house and eat and I also met my godfather that baptized me because he was in this country way back he even worked for the water company way back in the uh, oh in the middle middle 20s and he baptized me but then he went back to Italy because he had a wife kids back he had a farm back here below the town mm -hmm. and he spoke American too and we was walking through the Paese there you know they had uh, he was talking and he's talking American to me I thought American to him and uh, I still have the pocket watch that he bought me when he baptized me I still have a gift to my son yeah. and that's uh, that's uh, 80 years ago do you have any photos of, of this I didn't have no camera wow. then cousins they were like flies still had family over there they yeah. were all like flies in other words some of them my first cousin same name DeFazio that would be my father's uh, nephews they're in Toronto Canada okay they're in yeah they used to come down here occasionally you know to visit us so the whole time you're wearing this American uniform and you were raised born and raised in Pittsburgh PA Verna PA yeah, yeah they, they look past all that. They look past you, the uniform. Oh, yeah. They didn't uh, pay any. They look past it. You, <laughs> you, were, you were speaking Italian. You were just a long lost relative. Long yeah. lost. You, like, you just came back to town. Yeah, well, it's just, right? yeah, well, you know, it is. It's, uh, when you meet, uh, say, uh, there was my dad's brothers and sister, my mother, said, and say, well, this is this is their son. Oh, yeah. they thought they'd never see me. Yeah. You know? And cousins was all around. I know who the heck they all were, but they were like they were first, my first cousins, which I still have over there. I have first cousins, ones in Rome, and the, and the, the, I have one that's, that's still living in the town where my mother and dad were born. Then I have they spread out. Then I have some in uh, South America, uh -huh. and uh, in Canada. But then, when I was over there, we went to. Um, Caserta, that was where the King's Palace was in Caserta, Italy. That time, uh, Mount Vesuvius was erupting. Mm -hmm. And me and my buddy went to um, uh, uh, Pompeii, the new Pompeii. Mm -hmm. We went through the old Pompeii, too. Did you ever go through there? No. Very interesting. Yeah. The body of the woman and the child was buried under there. Stone streets and... Uh, went into the buildings it's unbelievable you had the middle of the spas they had it way back in them days well anyhow we was in the new pump and, and uh, we had parkas on with a hood you know and boots because Vesuvius was erupting there was um, smoke and fire and soot coming out of that and it was covering us you know it was I forget how thick it was on the ground and for the smoke you couldn't see it too much 
I told my buddy, I says, hey, I said, we better get, we better get out of here. I says, because if this thing erupts, they're going to be digging us up in 500 years and putting us on display <laughs> yeah. here. That thing could, because it was coming out of the sides and everything. So we got out of there. We spent a little time with beautiful, beautiful oh, yeah. churches there, the buildings. They got buildings here that they're, they're lucky they stand for 50 years. Over there, they're 1,000 years old and they're yeah. still standing, you know. Well, anyhow, we, we got out of there before it erupted. Well, anyhow, from there, we got orders to ship out. Going, we was going to go uh, with the invasion of Anzio. So we went to the seashore. Well, the 3rd Division was the one that made the uh, first landing, which was very, whoever thought of that was a very strategic move that they made because they came around Monte Cassino where the Germans was dug in there. Well, anyhow, when we, when we got, wasn't a shot fired. We hit the beaches in uh, Anzio and we started straight ahead. And as we started straight ahead towards Rome, there was mountains there. So then what, what they did, the uh, lieutenant comes up to me, he says, Sal, the face here, he says, you take the point. Hmm. Well, you know what the point is. You're the first one out there. And then 50 yards behind me would be the second point. Then behind him would be the company, whole company, or the whole division, really. You're the first target. And I said, well, thank you very much. I said, I'll remember you in my will. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, I didn't tell him that. Yeah. But that's what I thought. And I was scared, man. I really was. Because you, if there's anybody out there, you're the first one. Yeah. We're going out to meet the enemy. You're the first one to get it. You know? So I was hoping maybe if there was a sniper there, I was hoping that maybe he might be cross-eyed and a bad shot. He'd miss me. Well, anyhow... I kept going, had my eyeballs was open, and I would seen it. it was a dead soldier, German soldier, along the side of the road, which I felt bad for. He was half covered in mud. I said, oh, my God. I said, he has a mother and a father back home, too. He has a family. There he is, laying in like a dog. Well, anyhow, I figured, hey, we're getting close to the enemy if they didn't have time to pick him up. Yeah. So, anyhow, we got uh, within... Oh, I forget, within Rome, on this side, there was the mountains, and then the other side of the mountain was Rome. Well, anyhow, they they had a gun right outside of Rome. That that thing had a shell. I bet you it was as big as a streetcar when it shot it. It was loaded on three railroad cars, this gun. Wow. It'd come out, and when they shoot, you could hear it, and you could see that shell going past it. I mean, it was monstrous. And when it hit... It put a hole so deep you could call the, uh, the block layers in to lay the foundation. If you heard it, you were fine. It was past you. If you didn't, because when that thing hit, I mean, it, it really hit. And they would fire maybe three or four, and then they would sneak back into the mountains. By the time our planes got up there to get it, it was gone. It was in the mountains. You couldn't get them out. Then, then in the evening, they'd bring it out again, and they would fire some more. Hmm. Well, anyhow... Being that they made a good move by going into Anzio, because they had to pull a lot of troop, troops out from Monte Cassino, the Panzer Division, the tank division, to come over and defend that because we surrounded them. But the mistake they made, when we got, the mountain was ahead of us, we should have kept going yeah. to the mountain, to the top of the mountain. No, they stopped. The Germans come in, they got on top of the mountain and looking down our throats. Big mistake. Anyhow, we carried on, and uh, finally we hit resistance. We hit the German in the front lines. Was some shooting. I had a foxhole here, right here. Here comes a, a tank, one mm -hmm. of the army tank, right next to me. And they zeroed in on that, 37 millimeter. They come hitting that thing. Man, everybody's hollering, "Get that tank out of here!" Because they zeroed in on us there, you know. And I said, i got to get out of here. So me and my buddy, we got up and we went back to get away from that tank. Yeah. And by God, all hell broke loose. There was, there, there was cannon shit coming in there. I mean, it's, I wonder I didn't get a direct hit. It was all around me. You could feel the ground shaking. I was just beside myself. And man, when it, when it was all over, man, I, I was all, I don't know what the hell could tell you. 
But the medic happened to be there, and I told him, I said, hey, man, I said, you better give me something here. Give me some of the pill or something to get John down here. He says, and he looked at me, he said, nah, he said, you come with me. So he took me back into a farmhouse, and a lot of GIs wounded laying around there, and this one guy, it must have split his stomach, and his bladder was sticking out. They're trying to push it back in his stomach, couldn't do it, because his whole stomach was sticking out. Oh, my God. So finally, finally what they give, they gave me a pill, and the next thing I know, I was in a field hospital back. And then finally they figured, well, that's when they, they shipped me home then. And that's, that's when I came home. And that was, that was the end of that. But uh, it's terrible. You don't know until you get into it. You know, when you first go, you're thinking nothing of it until you're in it. By no and if anybody ever says they were no one scared, they're lying. And it was terrible. How many guys we lost at the river and at Monte Cassino. Terrible. Lots. How do you get over? You're scared the whole time. So it's just it's just a matter of suppressing it at times. You mean when I was over there? Yeah, absolutely. When you're in combat, do you just? Well, you had no time to think about anything. I guess before. And the after is, is the bad, but during it, you're not, you're just reacting what's coming, you're right? ju Yes, that's all. You're not thinking about death, you're not thinking no, about anything. No, just... no, not really. Uh -huh. Not, no, no, not really. Just when, um, just when he said we have to go back the second time, that's when I thought, well, I ain't coming back. Because it, we lost a lot of men, there was only eight of us that come back out, out of our, our whole platoon. There was three squads to a platoon, only eight of us come back. A lot wounded. Or just came back unwounded. That's all, eight of us. When when I went back, I hardly recognized too many of the guys. Hmm. But I have I have some pictures of me when my mother and they sent me some pepperoni <laughs> with, <laughs> with the rest area. Me and some of the guys said we were eating oh, yeah. some pepperoni. I got some of those pictures. So but, you came uh, back home? Did you have to stay in the hospital? No. Huh? No. No. Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I was. I was fine, but like I said, I never talked about it. Yeah. Not that I didn't want to, or that it would it would affect me. Yeah. No, that that didn't bother me. I just didn't talk about it. That's all. Never told anybody. I, yeah. I, I figured I'd come back in one piece, and I thank God for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of in '44, huh? Uh, yeah. '44. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then it wasn't too long after that, then the, no, the war right. was over, you know. Yeah. They went into, when they went into Rome, and it wasn't too long after I got yeah. back, they come in, went into Rome. Who was your rank? Uh, I was uh, private first class. PFC? Mm-hmm. So you got, uh, how many Purple Hearts, two then? One. One. Hit two places, but one Purple Heart. Oh, yeah. Hit two places, one Purple Heart, huh? Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. But, but I I gave it uh, my I gave everything I had I gave it to my son mm -hmm. and he made a beautiful collage out of Did whatever he? and he beautiful he made a nice job with it he has it I give it to him I give everything to him I give him the bronze star the purple heart and when did you as a matter of fact that's me that picture was taken in Italy oh get out yeah I was eighteen yeah. yeah. Now when did uh, you get the bronze star after the war? You said yeah, they they uh, they send it to me. When was this? And then oh, as a matter of fact, no, as a matter of fact, it wasn't too long ago. Really? Been all these years, yeah. All these years. And how did how did they they just give it to you? Did you no? Or did it look, I had put process? I had put a lot of this stuff in writing. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, one guy, it was uh, what happened to be talking. And he asked me where I was, you know, and I told him where I was at uh, Anzio in Monte Cassino. He says, you know, <clears throat> they want to know the stories from the veterans, Second World War, because there's so many dying off every day that they want the people to know that you guys have the story. And he said, do you have anything? I said, well, years ago I, I wrote stuff down. You know, I have it written down on paper. Mm -hmm. So he said, I went up to see, uh, uh, I was Tony DeLuca up there, 
and then he referred me to this uh, major, I think he was over there, was in the Air Corps. And he said, he said, I want to talk to you. He said, I made an appointment to go see him <coughs> at the office uh, up there at Penn Hills where Luke has his office, the next building. He said, you have stuff written down? I said, yeah. He said, listen, I'd like to see it. I, I, I said, well, okay. So I got it and I brought it up to him and he looked it over. He says, fine. He took photostat copies of it. Mm -hmm. And he sent it, I think it was either Washington, D.C. or one of those historical places, or the government stuff. And to my surprise, it wasn't too long after that, they sent me these, uh, the Bronze Star, and, and, and I, I, you know, I said, well, this is a big surprise to me from what I wrote down, what I went through, see. And that's how I got come about to get it. Get out. Mm-hmm. I didn't ask for it. I didn't tell him. Not you know, just from. He said right. because they wanted to put this, what everybody said, mm -hmm. on the records in the archives someplace. That's what this major told me from the Air Force. He said, "I'm glad you wrote this down and have it." Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just like on, now the the woman had called me from Harrisburg for 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 the interview. She says we want you on real bad. She said because we have nobody on from Monte Cassino in Anzio. I said, yeah. you're kidding. She says, no, we've never had anybody. You'll be the first. She said, but, so please, we, we were like, I said, okay. My, my daughter volunteered yeah. me fine. So like I say, it'll be on a couple of weeks or so. They're going to know it. The, and they're going to give me a tape off it, too. All right. That's what they told my daughter. Yeah. They said, well, we'll give you a tape and we'll let you know ahead of time. You know, when, when it's on. It's on, on Channel 48. That's the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Mm-hmm. I never knew that channel was around. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it either. I never, I never watched Part it. Heard of it though, but never, I never, never watched it until my daughter called me up one time and watched the program. She said, "Turn channel 48 on." I said, "What for?" I'm watching it. Turn it on. I said, "No, I'm watching the program." Yeah. She said, "Turn it on." I said, "No." I said, "What's it about?" She said, "It's about veterans telling their stories." Turn it on. I said, "Okay." So I turned it on. I watched it for, I'll be honest, a couple of minutes. Yeah. Went back to my whatever I was watching. And then that's when, when after a while, she told me she called the station. Right. And they volunteered me on it. It's on TV. Yeah. What, what did, um, you finally came home and told your parents who you met and who you oh, saw. Oh, yeah. What, what was your reaction? They're oh, ecstatic now. Oh, my God, yes. You know, to see, uh, like to say, to see my, my, my dad's brother and sister and my mother's brother and sister over there, you know. You, you 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 just think about it. You'd never know. You'd never think you'd ever see each other. You know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and like I say, the ones that would, the ones up in Canada, it was the three boys or the ones in Canada now. They were just young then when I was over. They had to be maybe fourteen, fifteen years old. And when I when I met them over there. But uh, and I used to remember my mother used to talk about Moon de Virgin. How what the hell is that? So as I'm going back with my cousins, they were taking me back to Avellino. And uh, I look on the side of the mountain up there, and that's where it was. There was a, 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 what would you call it, a place of, uh, well, every year the people used to go. There was, uh, I don't know how, what you call it. It was the Virgin Mary and the, okay. what do you call them, whatever they call them there. And that's when my cousin says, that's Moon de Virgin. And then they hit me. I said, that's what my mother used to talk about all the time. Yeah. It was like a shrine. Okay, right. Okay. It was a shrine. Beautiful. On the side of the mountain, you know. Yeah. I said, so that's what it was. And my mother always used to talk so about that. all these that. names and places and things are making yeah. sense. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Beautiful country. People are beautiful, too. Yeah. But I guess you, you realize, too, why they left, too. It wasn't, there wasn't much there, was it? Nothing well, there. Still poor. Well, my mother and dad, they worked in the fields as children. They got my dad, they used to get uh, 12, 14 cents a day. That's how much they got paid. Because uh, the big, the padrones, you know, they owned all the ground and uh, the peons worked for them. They'd feed them a little bit to whatever, they fed them in the afternoon. But they worked uh, uh, 12 to 16 hours a day, too, from morning till night. 14 cents a day 
That's why my dad, he didn't care. He didn't want to go back. I guess he didn't want to, all the memories of when he was a child, what he went through. Yeah. And like I say, his mother was still living. I missed her by six months. She died six months before I got dead. Your grandmother? Yeah. Mm hmm. That did. Hey, they had it tough over there, you know. Really, you know, you, you talk to some of the old, well, of course, they're all gone, the old timers that was there, but today they got it good over there. When you were there, did you feel that, um, did you feel American? Did you feel Italian? Or did you feel a little bit of both? Oh, no, I felt I was always an American of Italian descent. Uh huh. But uh, it just, it's just a feeling because you know that your parents were born there, you know. Yeah. And yours in a country that many miles away, you know, in the country that they lived. And no, I never considered myself a, a just an Italian of, a, of, of descent, but I'm a, always be American. Never, that never entered my mind. Yeah. Because <clears throat> I had a lot of cousins that went from there to Australia. Same name. Get out. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Yeah, scattered. And uh, up in Boston, I had cousins. I have cousins in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. they're scattered. Uh, South America. Yeah. I had a cousin there. That the same name as my dad. Name was Anthony DeFazio. And uh, he he come over here from South America. Or from no. South America, went to visit. Oh, okay, yeah, just to visit. Then he went back. Get out. Yeah. <clears throat> then I had other cousins from Australia. DeFazio. Their father and mine were his first cousins. Their grandfather and my father were brothers. They came over. As a matter of fact, he had a, I don't know whether it was Crafton or Swickley, he had a, a net because his uh, dad married a, a Calabrese that, that's below uh, Naples. Okay. In Calabria. Yeah, they're from Australia. So he, they had two of them. Uh -huh. One came one time and another one came another time. They were both from Australia, both DeFazios to out. visit. Then he went on to to uh, Crafton mm -hmm. to visit his uh, his mother's parents over there. Then they went. They, that's what they do over there. They uh, yeah. they take vacations. The one day he said, "I had a car. I sold it, and I used the money to travel." That's what they did. Yeah, he comes down. Yeah. Well, um, any final thoughts about? I mean, you obviously had a wonderful. Uh, it was well, sad under the circumstances you yeah, went back well, to I see often, the the family, your yeah. your family's town, but uh, I guess it was very memorable. No, then what a coincidence! I could still picture the town. You know, set on the mountain, had a big uh, plaza here. In, in yeah. There. But I often, well, occasionally, I, I occasionally I think about my buddy that looked like me, and think about a lot of them guys that. Never, never got back, you know, because they t took a hell of a shellacklin over there. Yeah. And you know, they're only kids; they were 18, 19 years old. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it doesn't bother me too much to talk about it because I never did. Yeah. But I do think about it. I still still picture their faces, you know, some of them that I was with. Well, you never had too much time to really get acquainted. Yeah. It, didn't, it wasn't like you, you socialized, you know, like, here you go here, <coughs> you go there, it just isn't like that. It just, um, but um, it was terrible, terrible. They made a lot of mistakes, the upper, you know, the upper echelon made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Of course, not, not that they wanted to, it just, right. you know, it just happened. And they uh, made a lot of good uh, decisions too, you know. But let's face it; it had to be done. Yeah. Because if we hadn't got involved, you know that Germany, they had the jet engine. Because they were sending the rockets to bomb England. Pilotless, they just didn't perfect it to hit wherever they're supposed to go. And it wouldn't have been, it had been less than a year, they would have had the atomic bomb because they was working on it. And if they would have perfected the jet engine and got an atomic bomb, it, it, do you think? Well, the thing is, I never, 
I always did what I was told. Right. Except that one time when I told that captain, which and I was right, to go get it yourself. You, know, Heck you yeah. know, shouldn't jeopardize somebody else's life, you know. But I, I did without question. Never, never asked. I, I say today that the, the American soldier is, is the best soldier in the world, to my opinion. And I, and I really mean it. I think they are. You know, but uh, that's a shame, you know, it has to be that way. But uh, like I say, if, uh, they maybe say, well, what are we? we? This country is just the peacekeepers of the world. But if somebody didn't step in and do something, and, and the, 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 the people that, uh, that are really mean, like uh, if they would have won the war, you know what would have happened in this country, man. They would have eliminated, uh, uh, they would have eliminated all the scholars that teach. If, if Japan and Germany and them would have won the war, they'd have got rid of the intellectuals, the school teachers, the, the demonstrators. They'd have got rid of everybody. Because they would want you under their rule, there wouldn't be there wouldn't have been no freedom over here. They would have taken over, man, and they would have slaughtered a lot of people, like Germany did with the Jewish peoples. Was a, what's a, the very disgrace that they did, and they would have done it here. They would have eliminated millions of people because they didn't want nobody smarter than them. They want to put you under their hand, right? And that's what they want. So if we didn't step in. And and do the job. God knows what it would have been today here. Yeah. So, I that's that's of course that's my own opinion. Yeah. You think many people's attitudes uh, about Italians changed? You think that anybody respected Italians? Or well, they, 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 you know, if you know, put them in, there was respect and then change. But you know, hey, you know. Well, I, it wasn't like it used to be, like go back even 50, 60 years ago or less, that uh, but the a, lot of people, it out. They, a lot of people, they, even today, they don't, have no, they don't have no use for Italians. Why? I don't know. Because the Italians gave the world a lot of things. A lot of things. Hey, every time they eat pizza, they just say, hey, well, thanks. Well, not only that, <laughs> I don't care whether it's your, put your paintings or your sculptures or, you. or you're building all these, bu buildings is built with all these beautiful uh, scutcheons or what do you call them? The, who chiseled them out? They did. Yeah. Uh, they laid the water lines. They laid the gas lines. They did the concrete work, the brick work. They did all that. They built this kind of... Yes, they, and they did a fine job. They built, they did their share. You know, most of it I think could be jealousy. I don't know what yeah. you know what, it, but it isn't as bad today as it was back then. To get a job back then, how many people changed their name hmm. from Italian to something else just to get a job? Oh yeah, and I know a few of them too. You, know. you couldn't get a job if your name ended in A E I O or U. All Italian names ended it in vowels. Yeah. And and they worked. That's why where I worked, there was a, a manager there but years ago. A fella went to him and asked him for a job and he's it was American fella, I guess, and he says, I don't hire anybody but Italians here. He said, Because they work. Because at that time they were all Italians working for the water company. Yeah, every one of them, all Italians, in the, in the labor gang, and because uh, they did the work, they did all the good, the hard work. Okay. Yeah, hmm. But uh, but yeah, yeah, but still, there are people, a lot of ignorant people, I guess, you know. Yeah. That uh, don't care. But if you look back, like I say, uh, Italy has given the world a lot of things, a lot of things. Yes, yeah. it has. Heck, the the bugle boy for 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 custard when they were slaughtered when the Indians slaughtered he was Italian his name was Martino get out yeah he was a bugle boy for the reason he was saved because custard sent him back to, to tell him to get some help to come to come and help him out and his name was I forget his first name his name was Martino he was the bugle boy for custard custard right. fact, yeah you know. can read history yeah yeah he you was know. Italian as a matter of fact he died in the, when the heck did he die here. Early 1900s. Yeah. His last name was Martino. Martino. Mm. Check that out. Yeah, you check it out. That's, that's what he was. 
Well, I don't... Anything else? I, I just... That was well, so interesting to hear about that. And well, the thing too. is, you can't, uh, you can't remember everything, you know. Yeah. But uh, we had some good times in the service. And, yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, I almost enlisted again when I came back. Oh, did you? I wanted to go to the South Pacific. Oh, yeah? Yeah, and uh, they called me in. Uh, I said, I'm going to re register, you know, to go to South Pacific. And he said, well, I'm going to tell you something. It's up to you. He said, but you're going to be good out on the point system. Yeah. You know, to go home. He said, well, that's up to you. Well, I'll we'll sign you up again. So I thought it over, and I says, mm. I said, I might as well go out. I did. But uh, I enjoyed the service. I really did. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't. A, it was a good life. wasn't bad. Yeah. Peace time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Peace time was. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it's a good education. Let's put it that yeah, way. Good too. education. You couldn't. You couldn't buy that education that you get yeah. everywhere you went or what you did. You know. Yeah. Just thinking, you were eighteen, nineteen years old, but and uh, you. You were thrown into the adult world, and you grew up fast. Uh, you certainly do, you know. Yeah. But, uh, like I say, it's, it's, uh, you know, war is hell, that's what yeah. they say. And, and believe me, it is. I don't know whether, if them big shots had to go fight between themselves, they would never have a war. They would send somebody else to do the dirty work. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, what are you going to do? That's, that's life. Well... I thank you very much for well, sitting down. Glad and to do it. I really enjoyed it, and uh, thank you for your service. Thank you for you what you did, and and what a wonderful story, what a great interview. Yeah. You, you really talk. For you said, "Oh, I'm quiet. I'm shy." I I don't. I really I don't talk. I know, even great. even on a, even if I get on the phone, yeah. I say what I have to. Some I never make phone calls. Yeah. But but if somebody gets on the phone, I say yeah yeah, and I cut it short. And I'm I'm just that way. I'm not that yeah. type. I'm not a talker, a big talker, but but this year this I, is great. the interview, you know, like I said, I wouldn't have done it. I'd done it for your dad, really, because <laughs> I knew them all, you know, all my life. Thank you. But, uh, but, uh, grazie mille. Yeah. Okay. Yeah.